We begin a new series today called Rise Up. And this series is about partnering and parenting for the next generation. And our passion, or my passion, I think it's our passion, is that our children would rise up into faith and friendship with God and that they would live in the blessing of God, be the people of God that this world desperately needs, that they would go make a difference in this world and then enjoy life in heaven, amen? That's what we're about here. And some of you automatically are saying, well, I'm not a parent, so this doesn't really apply to me. And actually, one of my children last night, I won't say who, but one of my children literally last night said, seems like a boring series we're moving into. And I said, oh yeah, tell me about that. And this child said, well, I'm not a parent, so it doesn't relate to me. But really, this series is just a series about influence in the context of parenting. Leadership is influence. And so if you're a leader, if you are influencing anyone, there will be lots of principles and practicals in this service that you, or in this series that you can take and just apply. But more than that, we all need to understand it doesn't matter whether you're single, whether you're an empty, empty nester, or you're younger and haven't yet had kids. It takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a church to make a disciple. There is nothing biblical about putting the entire discipleship and growth of a child on the home. It starts in the home, but it requires the church. And so it is going to require old people, young people, everyone to come together, to partner together, to raise up this next generation. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more and illustrate that for you later on. It is true that parents have the greatest potential to influence the spiritual life of their children. But parents, you're not all that your children need. They need other people. Uh, you're going to need other people to fill in the gaps for what you're not. And that's the beautiful thing about the body of Christ. And so we come to this recognizing that all of us are critical to this path of raising up our children. Today I wanna to talk about the pivotal matter of parenting, or maybe the pivotal matter of leadership, of influence. I think personally for parents, this is the main thing that everything comes from and everything rests on. And I'm gonna say it more as a negative to start with and then tell you, but the pivotal matter of parenting is not what you do, it's who you are. The pivotal matter of parenting is not what you do, some of you are saying, what do I need to do? What do I gotta do for my kids? Because they're not doing what I want them to do, so what do I have to do? The pivotal matter of your pairing isn't what you do. It's not your skills, it's who you are. And the reason for that is because what kids learn will be more caught than taught. Kids are watching you. Kids are listening to you. They know how you react. They know what your passions are. They know what faith you have. They're watching you. And they are picking things up all through the week as they live life from you. And so if you reduce parenting to a few skills about, oh, we're gonna spend time in the word around the table and we're gonna uh, uh, you know, do a few things, go on a mission trip together, kids are picking up so much more than that, your life is under surveillance. And let me just quickly say, like, no, 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 we believe the word of God is important around the table, but it's more than that, it's everywhere you go. When you walk on the road, when you rise up, when you go to sleep, it's who you are, and they are watching you. Now, it was interesting, uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, there was a couple that we were having breakfast with or having coffee with, I guess, in the morning, and they were, the, 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 the woman had taken, she's an empty nester now, and she had taken our, uh, one of our daughters out, and she said to us, oh, by the way, you need to know something. There's nothing about your life that's private anymore. And I was like, what did our kids say about us? But the point just being, like, your kids know you. They're watching you, and there's good and bad about that, the, the, actually the good news about that is that your kids 
will make choices about how they want to live based upon the standard that you set. So they will literally be watching you and for, for some, they will say, I, I, let's just talk about me for a second. They will say, I don't really want to live like dad's messy world. I'm, I'm, I've said this before, I'm kind of messy. And I have some kids that are very clean and organized. And like, I don't want that. I kind of hope that my kids don't take my messiness. I hope they see my missional heart. And they know how to live a missional lifestyle because of it. You are modeling for your kids what God's purpose is for them in their life. And you will become the standard by which they measure so many things in their life. Now, here's another axiom. You can't lead your kids where you're not going. You can point them, but you can't lead them. And most of them will sniff it out when you say do this, but you don't do it yourself. You can't lead kids where you're not going, and also you will parent out of who you are, and you will tend to reproduce who you are. The good news is that our kids do have choice, and so in some ways they can say, I don't want to be like that. I'd like to be something else. But you are producing, you are modeling for your kids. And so your job as a parent or as an influencer, a leader, if you're leading people, is to model, and it's God's job to move. Your job is to model, and then pray, and say, God, move. And so today, we ought to be asking the question, when you look in the mirror, Do you reflect what you hope your kids will resemble? This is where we start as parents. I can't start with what do I want my kid to become. I need to start with who I am as a person. And there's this pattern in the Bible called the problem or it's called generational sin. It's the problem of generational sin. And I just want to show this to you today, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12 to start out with, but the pattern is explained in Numbers 14, 18, where it says that the sins of the fathers visit to the third and fourth generation, that who the father is, and I think we can add in who the mother is, the, the sins are passed on from generation to generation, and I want you to see this in one of the most important families in the Bible, Uh, This family was the family that God used to build the nation of Israel. If you know anything about the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people, and he started with a man named Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had Joseph. And so as you read the Bible, often they will say the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, four generations. And I want to show you what happens with sin from one generation to the next. We're going to start with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Now Abraham, his initial name, he was named Abram, and then God changed his name to Abraham because he became the father of nations. But in Genesis chapter 12, what we read is a story of Abram, Abe, I'll just call him Abe so we're not confused, not trusting God and lying. How many of you know No that the Abraham you learned about as a child has a problem with lying. Big problem. He didn't trust God. God said, look, I'm going to give you a son, and through that son, there's gonna be a great nation. I have a great future for you. I will protect you. I will bless you. And Abraham just struggled to trust God. And before you look too negatively on Abe, look at your life first. Like, when do you struggle to trust God? God, when is the last time you lied or were deceptive? In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham moves, Abe moves, and this is what it says. Now, there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know you are a Beautiful woman in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, 
and they will let you live. Say you are my sister for your sake. And so Abraham, Abe, doesn't trust in the future that God has already declared over his life And he takes life into his own hands. He sees life from his own eyes. And he thinks, we're just going to lie about this. And if you know the story, what, what occurs is it's true. The Egyptian men start to see an opportunity with Sarai. And they start to look at her and say, whoa. And God starts to afflict the Egyptians. God protects this family in the midst of the sin. And God brings judgment but what is very interesting as you look at Abraham's sin, and he, this happened multiple times where he just lied, he didn't trust God, and he just lied, is if you now flip over to his son in Genesis chapter 26, his son was Isaac, and there's a very similar circumstance. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 6, it says, So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, She is... My sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of that place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. Almost the exact same circumstance from one generation to the next. Well, Isaac had a wife. Her name was Rebecca, the woman that was beautiful. And they had some other problems other than lying going on. They tended to play favorites with their children. One loved Esau, Jacob loved Esau, or excuse me, Isaac loved Esau, and Rebekah loved Jacob. And if you know the story, Jacob one day comes and he steals, deceptively steals the blessing from his brother Esau. And how does he do this? He does it with the help of his mother, who continued in this path of of, uh, deception, right? Rebecca helps Jacob steal the blessing, Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. And here's what happens after he steals the blessing. It says, now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Lying, Leads, leads to, and deception leads to playing favorites with kids and deception in the relationship, which leads to hatred, which ultimately results in two brothers wanting to kill each other. So we have Abe, Isaac, Jacob. Then Jacob has a bunch of kids, and one of those kids is Joseph. One of Jacob's problem was playing favorites, loving one child over another. Now if we go to Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, you know the story. Jacob had all these kids and he loved one more than the others. This is what the scriptures say. Now Israel, now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. You see what's happening from generation to generation? From lying to deception to hatred to playing favorites. Abe lies, so does Isaac. Isaac plays favorites, so does Jacob. Jacob is hated by his brothers, so is Joseph. And the beautiful thing, if you look at Joseph's life, is he somehow stops that path of sin. I mean, he trusts God. He goes into jail, he gets sold into slavery, and he trusts God. So you are not a victim of your past. You are not a prison of your past. But if you don't consider it, if you don't look in the mirror, you may very well just pass on some of the sins. You will most likely pass on some of the sins of the fathers and the mothers to their children. And so the primary matter of parenting 
is not what you do, it's who you are. And what I would love for us to do is just ask ourselves the question, who are we? Are we the people that our kids need us to be? And with that question comes another question, and it's this, how do people change? Because maybe as you look at your life, you're saying, I got some deep-rooted sin issues in my life. Maybe you've been hurt. Many of you have been hurt. Maybe it's possible to say that there's no one here that is unscathed by our parents. The question is, how does change happen? Because like, I want to be God who my kids need me to be. I want to be the vessel that you would use so that my kids can see the hope and the blessing. But I also recognize I got some issues in this life. I got some sin going on here. And there's some sin, honestly, that some of you have been carrying around that it's been inside of you, at the root of you for years. And you would say, I don't know how to get rid of it. I don't know how to deal with it. And I just wanna talk about how does change happen in our lives today? Because rather than giving you four steps of what you need to do as parents, I would just really love for us to focus on becoming the people God wants us to be. I wanna take you to Ezekiel chapter 36, which I believe describes how change happens. I've been a Christian for a long time. I've been in discipleship. I've been obviously a pastor, I've been to seminary, and there is a lot of do's. Do this, do that. And I think this is at the root of change. So if you wanna change some of those areas of your life that you would love not to pass on to your children, let's just look at what Ezekiel chapter 36 says. I wanna read this from the word of God. There's something just about reading from the word, not on just a, a phone, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's powerful and it allows you to remember it and, and I just think it speaks and I underline and I, I just encourage you to do that. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22, this is what the Lord says through Ezekiel. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. In other words, what God is saying is, hey, I'm doing this so the glory of God, the savior of your life will be lifted up. And this is what he says in verse 25. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I, have, that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Now what he's saying here is he's saying, I'm gonna put my spirit inside of you and it's through my spirit that change is going to happen. I would declare to you today that those deep-rooted hurts in your life, like the sin, whatever it is, you, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? Like what is the thing that you struggle with in your life? Is it anger? Is it your self-concept of like not believing what God says about you and you're tempted to believe what everybody else says about you? Is it idols? Like, yeah, well, yeah I believe the kingdom's good, I'm gonna live for the kingdom, but got a lot of more important things to live for in this world. Like, what is it in your life? It is the Spirit of God in my experience and in the Word of God that is the only thing that can change you. It, it, it's, it's not something you can just magically make happen by willpower in your life. 
There's a quote that I love, and it comes from the book, The Spiritual Disciplines for a Christian Life. And it says this, the goal of godliness isn't found on the surface of Christianity. It has to be dug from the depths within the tools of the disciplines. But for those who persevere, the treasures are more than worth the troubles. Like what he's saying here is he's saying, if you want to change, it's going to take serious war by the Spirit in your spirit and your soul. And it's not just going to happen by just showing up to church once a week and doing something. Like, it's going to take work and sometimes fasting in prayer, in seeking the Lord. And that's why we just gave the, the word of God out today because guess what the sword of the Spirit is? Guess what it is that the Spirit, the instrument that the Spirit uses to dig into your life? It's the word of God. And so we just gave it out to the kids today. Why did we give it to the kids? Because it's the very thing that when you give the Spirit this to work with, he starts to change you and show you things about yourself that you can't get through a psychologist. Um, there's a phrase that we used to always say, right? That when you read the Bible, it reads you. And that's why you ought to have a Bible reading plan and don't just always read the devotions. Because there's something like as you start to understand this, you start reading through it, you're like, whoa, like the Spirit of God is taking this and he's using it to divide soul and spirit, joint merit, to judge the thoughts and attitudes of my heart. Now I can just tell you story after story. Sometimes he encourages me. I'm feeling terrible about myself. And I take the word and I read it. Sometimes I'm feeling good about myself. And I take the word and God's like, you're thinking a little too good about yourself. It's like, I love you the way you are, but I love you too much to leave you the way you are. Because your kids need more than you're giving them and your congregation needs more. So the question is, will you allow the Spirit of God to change you? Will you look in the mirror through the Word of God and say, God, by your grace, like I just want to be who you want me to be. I want you to love the things you want me to love. I want to have your heart. I want to live, living, breathing, and bleeding the things that, that God is all about. Because my kids are going, what they learn is going to be more caught than taught. And I can't program something for them to learn as much as I can be that person. And it's going to come out of every part of I am. So may we be a people that is committed to the Spirit of God. Now, I want to just talk about the need for other families because the fact is that you will never be all that your kids need to understand who God is and what he has for them. There are some gaps in your life, and this is what we call the body of Christ. So there's some gaps. Some, some of those are sin gaps. Some of those are uh, gift gaps. Like some of you are not wonderful at teaching. You are wonderful at serving and providing. So that's why the, 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 the God put together the, the body of Christ and we're going to need one each other. Now I just want to illustrate this to you. I grew up in a family. I was very blessed to grow up in the home that I grew up in. My parents loved me. They were committed to each other. I watched them sacrifice and struggle so that we could go to Christian camps and be involved in the things that mattered. And like, they just blessed. I was so blessed by the heritage that I had from my parents. And I learned so much from them. They're probably listening this morning. My dad's at the hospital and just going through a difficult time of life. And I love you, mom and dad. And they just blessed me. But they weren't all that I needed. The, God said, I, I'm going to bring other families and they're going to also help to raise up Mark Wolf. And there was another family I'll just talk about 
that was the other probably most significant family in my life. It was the Height family. Um, they had a son that I met at the end of my ninth grade year. He became one of my closest friends. Uh, he, I mean, he was just an amazing guy. He came at a pivotal time in my life. Uh, there was barely a weekend that went by that we didn't spend time together. We went to youth group together. We did ridiculous things together. We were out at the camp on the weekends doing different things. We, I learned to barefoot water ski with this guy. Uh, we just had an awesome time, and he became really one of my closest friends for the longest time. If you've been paying attention this past week to Facebook, he passed away on Monday. And, you know, sad story, but God is good, and we're walking through it. So much of who I am today is because of his family. There was, as I said, barely a weekend that would go by that I wasn't at his house. The amount of food that I ate through those years. <laughs> I mean, my parents were always come home and eat and then go back. I mean, we, I spent so much time there. Um, this was a family that was very involved in the youth ministry at the church, and so we would do all-nighters at his house. Uh, I don't know how many New Year's Eves we stayed up the entire night with the whole youth group at his house. We sat around the table. They had so many people that came into their home that they just fed and loved on. And I'll tell you this, I learned, I was thinking about this this past week, like I learned somewhat of this missional life of being with people around the table from them, from just watching them and being part of it. I remember there was a, a, a day that I was struggling, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but struggling with some sort of sin and guilt in my life and like just wanting to live holy before God and just struggling. And so I called up his mom. His, his mom's name is Heather. And I just said, hey, Heather. I don't know, I was a 17-year-old kid, and I just said, hey, I'm just really struggling, and I need someone to talk to. And she just, like, spoke truth to me and uh, prayed over me. Um, I, I remember his dad I learned grace from his dad. Uh, Roger is a pretty flat guy, doesn't really get angry, kind of goes with the flow. In our senior, actually it was my senior year, we had the end of the year church banquet for youth, right? And it was outdoors at someone's house on a bay with a pool and just this amazing place, right? And three of the guys who were student leaders in the youth group, I was one of them. Phil was another one, and another guy was Scott. During this end of the year celebration, put all the money and energy into this thing, awesome food, we started talking, and we said, hey, let's like stage a little pushing around the pool, argument around the pool, something like that, and push someone in. So we started pushing each other around and all this stuff, and Phil got pushed in the pool. And Roger, who was part of organizing this thing, came over, and I don't know, that was the maddest that I've ever seen him. He kicked us out of our senior celebration. Of the, we got kicked out. The student leaders got booted out of this thing. And I was like, whoa, he is mad and the very next time I saw him, he was just like, man, love you, like grace, right? Like I learned so much from watching their family and living in my family. And this is what we want to become as a church, right? That we would be the people of God who partner together and be what our kids need. That's why we call this church family. It's not events on the weekend. It's a family that meets together. And so I just want to ask you to consider a couple questions 
as we close here today, and I think Matt's going to come or the team's going to come. And actually, I want us to have a time of reflection. And the first thing I want us to reflect upon is, um, are you committed to be that for each other? Like, it takes time. That's why we do neighbor groups. That's why we spend time together because it's the only way. You can't have a relationship from a distance. And so church has to be more than what happens here. It has to extend into the week. But here's the, the more, in question, more important question that I want you to reflect upon today. Come on. Because you're going to reflect. They're going to sing and you're going to reflect I just want you to reflect on, like, who are you? Like, when you look at yourself. Are you reflecting what you hope your kids resemble? And if you're not, the Spirit of God is in you. And he's ready to change you. But you have to give him a tool. You have to give him yourself. In fact, the scriptures say, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then take the word of God and start to meditate on it, to dig into it, let it read you, and let the spirit change you. We're gonna talk over this series about, actually next week we'll talk about what do we do as parents we're starting, first of all, looking at ourselves because who you are is far more important than what you do. So I would just invite you to, if you want, close your eyes. If you want, keep your eyes open. But listen to the words of the song and listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to you today that you might become all that your kids need. Amen?